Welcome back again. Um, this lecture is based on learning unit three, which is basically your chapter three of your prescribed uh, learning material. It is based on project planning. Project planning is very important. They say here, the key to successful project execution is in the planning. That's why most of the times people would say, if you are not planning, then you are planning to fail. That's what they basically say. They're trying to say that planning is very important. Planning provides the means to translate the specifications of the project into action. Planning is a proactive endeavor to anticipate potential problems and design interventions into the plan to prevent these problems from happening. Before you can start with planning a project, it's very important that you have these particular uh, things in place, which we call a sound platform for planning. Number one is the need for and the objectives of the project are clear and a project charter is signed. A project charter, it's a document that has got the, the objectives while you embark on that particular project. And the stakeholder is supposed to sign, basically, to say that we understand why the project is all about. Secondly, it has been established that the project is in line with the strategic objectives of the host organization. It is very important. Why would you go and you know, waste time working on a project that is not in line with the strategic objectives of the host organization? It's useless because uh, strate strategic objectives can only be achieved by means of using projects. Number three, a stakeholder analysis identified all appropriate role players and stakeholders. A project governance structure, such as the project sponsor, steering committee, or project management office has been established, very important. The project has clear reporting arrangements in place. A project manager and a dedicated and competent project team have been appointed. You need to have these people in place. A pro project pro uh, proposal has been approved, indicating the feasibility of the project. Obviously, you cannot start planning unless the project has been approved, saying that it's feasible to embark on it. <coughs> Planning can be seen as a process. You need things that will guide you as to um, how the planning should go. The input would be your project charter. Remember, project charter has got all the objectives. And then specifications as to what are the requirements. Uh, or rather uh, expectations of uh, the customer. And then you will then have the tools and techniques that you need to use to do your planning. And you need to have some standards. Basically, you develop the standards and the procedures. And then eventually, after you're done with the planning, your output would be your project business plan and you are supporting plans. The project planning tools and techniques that are normally used are these four. Number one is the work breakdown structure. Number two is the Gantt chart. Number three is the network diagrams and the critical path method. Number four is the program evaluation and review technique. So what we're going to do, <coughs> because the fourth one is mostly used by you know, engineering people, 
We are going to basically explain the first three. The WBS, which is the work breakdown structure, can look like this. Um, although I don't like, you know, a the one that is structured this way, I prefer a, a diagram, you know, WBS. So I really appeal to all students that they use a diagram format because this one really for a for an assignment looks ugly. Sorry to say that. <laughs> okay, an example that we have here is a newsletter project. Um, uh, a newsletter uh, project. How you go about doing your WBS, or what is a WBS? A WBS is basically a structure of activities towards uh, the completion of that particular project. You take the project, you break it down into smaller chunks of works so that you can easily manage uh, the project. Usually the example that I use in class is, you know, uh, a loaf of bread. Taking a loaf of bread, you're just trying to eat it as whole as it is, it becomes challenging. But once you slice it, then you have take those slices as activities. Then you can deal with one slice at a time. So <laughs> you can manage your, your food nicely. <clears throat> so a work breakdown structure is basically like that. What you do, <coughs> you start from level one, which is your finalized, rather complete uh, project. Then you cascade it down to your very first activity, which will have a higher number. You are going to ask yourself this. Before we can have a newsletter project that is finalized. What was the last activity or task that was supposed to be done? Then you mention that particular activity, which is 2.0. Then they say here, according to this project, it's a must head and design which is complete. But you cannot have a must head and a design that is complete unless you have 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3, which is 2.1, designer appointed, concept submitted, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> then the design is approved. But you cannot start working on that unless level three is completed, which is stories and photographs are complete. Here yeah, they've sub, uh, divided that level into two, which they are further divided into other activities. 3.1, they say the articles are finalized. 3.2 is photographs and illustrations completed. I guess we all know, even though we're not experts in this field, but we all know that uh, if you are to produce a newsletter, if let's say, for instance, there's an event somewhere, you need to go there physically, possibly, you take photos and all that, then once you've taken the photos, maybe interviewed people and so forth, it's only then that you can start writing the stories, you know, under um, <coughs> the photos. Then maybe even the graphs and so forth, you know. Then once all that is done, it's only then that you can have level two, and then there, thereafter you have your level one. So basically, you break, your, uh, you break down your project, starting with the actual finalized project, and then you cascade down to, to, to the very first activity that you're supposed to do. Uh, well, a nice example that I usually use is, again, building a house. Before you can say that we can have a completed house, what is the last activity that's supposed to be done. Okay, it depends, but for now I would say plastering. Maybe it's plastering or painting. So that would be maybe level 2.0. 
But you cannot start plastering unless another activity has been completed, which could be your roofing. You need to have done the roofing. But before you can say, OK, my roofing is complete, there are some activities that you're supposed to do under roofing. It could be, let's say, you work out your trusses, you know, the timber. You put it, you lay it on the walls. And then you lay the tiles. It's another activity, laying of tiles. And then another activity maybe is fitting the, the, the ceiling. Then you can say, you know, the, the roofing is completed. But you cannot start roofing unless activity, uh, is it one, two, three? Activity number four is done. What is that activity number four? It's the walls. You cannot, you know, lay the trusses or put the trusses if you do not have the walls. That could be, a, you know, a deliverable. And you cannot have the walls that are completed unless you have the foundation. So you need to have maybe another activity, which is level five, which is your foundation. So basically what happens here is the activity that has got a higher number, that is level, is basically you are very first activity. Then you go up to the finalized project. Okay, like I said, uh, students, please, when you work out your WBS, it should be a diag in diagram format. <coughs> Okay, there are many ways in which you can actually, you know, categorize or do your WBS. You can use uh, technological or functional uh, disciplines. That is, <coughs> uh, e.g., where the, the marketing specialist could be scheduled separately from a machine operators, you know, in terms of the discipline that these people are working in. You can then split the task in accordance to that. Then number two, you can sp you know, uh, do the breakdown um, using the organizational structures. They say here, in a clearly divided organization or set of separate organizations in a cooperative venture, the WPS could be established according to the reporting structures. Like for instance, cooperative venture. Um, like for instance, let's say uh, there's this particular project that is worked upon by three organizations. So you can say, let's say for instance, you have telecom working on this particular one. I mean, there's telecom, there's um, ESCOM, there's um, maybe Transnet, you know, something like that. Then you can then categorize your activities or works in terms of those organizations. It's another way. Even though my example is not, is not that perfect, but I think it might give you some clue as to how you can go about doing it. Then number three, physical location. The WBS can be based on the geographical locations instead of on the people. Uh, example again, it's when you have an organization that has got maybe branches, you know, they got a branch there, they got a branch in another area and another one maybe somewhere else. So you can basically s split, you, you know, your task uh, in terms of where those branches are basically located. I've, um, I've seen, you know, other methods which are not here, like if, even in terms of transportation, you can actually split your your activities in terms of those maybe transportation uh, modes and so forth. Then you got systems and subsystems. When there is a clear differentiation between several aspects of the project, the WBS can be put together to reflect this in terms of a system. Think about manufacturing a car. You know, a car, I think maybe it's actually the activities are split into system. You got 
the part where or a point where they fit in the you know the ignition system and then another point where they fit in maybe the fuel uh, system and and so forth so you can actually categorize your activities in terms of the systems once you're done with your WBS, you, you know all the activities, now have all the activities. You need now to take those activities, you post them onto the gun chart. Because the gun chart will basically help you to indicate when the activity is supposed to start, and that particular activity will be followed by which activity, and so forth. Uh, when one looks at the at the gunshot should see even the uh, the time frame rather the the time that will take that particular project to to be finalized okay they say that a gunshot originated from Henry Gunt in 1861 that guy unfortunately he left us in 1919 but at least you left something available that we can use. Number three, it is a visual portrayal of all the milestones of the project. Number three, the duration of the milestones is indicated on the x-axis and the milestones are indicated on the y-axis. I want us to rectify this. Even though we're talking about the milestones, remember I said sometimes milestones and activities are used interchangeably. But I want us to say, you can actually refer to these milestones they're talking about here, activities. We say these are activities. And milestones would be all those diamond um, figures that you see on the gunshot. Basically, those ones are your checkpoints. For instance, um, the, you know, the first uh, diamond uh, figure there, they say what they are doing there is test the mobile application part. They are testing, you know, like you check whether everything so far is done, you know, the way they are supposed to, and so forth. So let's see the very first activity there. They say it is uh, development and approval of project. That activity will start in the mid of June. It's going to go up to the mid of August. Don't mind those. Those are basically your titles, preparation and planning, which the activity is your development and approval of project. Then the next, they say it's research. Then they look at the tools and technologies and so forth. All that, the activities will start in the beginning of July and end of, of, of August. And it goes on and on until uh, your project is basically finalized. Another important thing that you need to take notice of is that the activity that was right at the bottom the last activity that you mentioned on your WBS, that activity will come on top. It will be the first activity that you need to put on the gunshot. Because remember, even though it's down there with a higher level, but it's your first activity that you're supposed to, to tackle. So when it comes to the gunshot, example that i given you was the building of your house, we have a, a foundation. Foundation was the last um, activity to, I mean, was the last activity to be mentioned on the WBS. But when it comes to the gunshot, it should be the first activity on top there. Okay, you can use a gunshot or you can use a network diagram. Basically, these two, they perform, you know, the same. Uh, job basically they do the same thing okay the network diagrams they say 
And network diagrams are basically reverse of the gunshot. In other words, they compete with the gunshot. And they are more useful for projects with higher levels of complexity. If ever you're working on a very huge, you know, complex project, it's going, it's going to be a challenge to make use of a gunshot. But with a network diagrams, it becomes possible. Number two, an activity is represented by means of a network rather than a bar chart. When using the diagrams, it is useful to locate strategically important tasks, such as those that need to be accomplished before other paths can begin. Before a network diagram can be uh, constructed, the clarification of dependencies is crucial. What are these dependencies that we're talking about? There are four types of dependencies. The first one is finish to start, which is uh, your FS. They say until the predecessor is finished, the dependent cannot start. What do they mean is, you should first finalize or complete the first activity, which is the predecessor, before the next activity can be started. And I am pleading with you students, we're talking about a predecessor, not an, uh, you know, ancestors. Sometimes students, they mention such things. It becomes a little bit you know, confusing. It's a predecessor. Number two, start to start, meaning that until the predecessor starts, the dependent activity cannot start. Number three, start to finish. Until the predecessor starts, the dependent cannot finish. Then lastly, we have finish to finish. Until the predecessor finishes, the dependent activity cannot finish. These are dependencies. Now, the network diagrams that we're talking about, they see here we got two types. The first one is an activity on arrow, A on A, and number two, an activity on node, A O N. An arrow indicates the direction of the workflow, and then a node indicates the activity or event. The information shown in a node are this, is the activity name, the duration, the activity early start time, which is the ES, the early finish time, which is the EF, late start time, which is the LS, and the late finish time, which is the LF. So this is an example of a note. I've taken that from Hazer and Render 2014. We have an activity name or symbol in this regard. We have A there. It's using symbols or numbers, uh, in fact, most projects, they use symbols or, or numbers because it's easy to use a symbol and then you can then indicate or rather explain uh, later on as to what is that symbol standing for because of the space you don't have enough space in there and then you got a duration that will take that activity to be completed which in this regard it's two days then you got the earliest start which is ES then you got the earliest finish time which is your EF then you got your latest start, which is your LS, and then you got your latest finish, which is your LF. So all this information is very important for us to even 
work out our critical path. Um, you will see what I mean about that. Okay, an example of a, a network diagram looks like this. Now what happens is we got a start point, we just have that node as our start. Then we got uh, activity A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. You can have as many activities as possible, depending on how complex your project is. Let us look at activity A. Activity A, the start time is zero, meaning that the day we start with the project, we start with activity A. And then it's going to um, last for two days. On the second day, we need to be done with that particular activity. That is our earliest, but even our latest start, we got zero and two. Now, let's compare activity A with activity B. When it comes to activity B, we have our earliest start, which is zero, and our latest start, which is three. And the, that activity will basically take us three days to finish. But we got the latest start, which is one day. In other words, we can be able to delay this particular activity by one day. Then if ever we delayed it by one day, it means we'll be done on the fourth day with it, which will basically be three days. So looking at diagram. The activities that form the critical path of the project are those activities that cannot be delayed. The ones that are having those thicker arrows, I hope you can see them, that indicates your critical path. Activity A cannot be delayed. Activity C cannot be delayed. Activity E cannot be delayed, activity G cannot be delayed, and even activity H cannot be delayed. But activity B, C, D, and F can be delayed. So this is how we determine our critical path. Um, I may ask that you Give me the slack time of activity B. Slack basically is the time by which an activity can be delayed. That is slack time. So what you can do, you can minus your earliest start from your latest start, and then you can get your uh, slack time. Or you can minus your alias finish from your latest finish, then you can get your select time. You can do so even with the other activities as well. Then we got different types of project planning, which we're going to look at, you know, later on, uh, like the risk management plan, Quality management plan, communication management plan, uh, cost management plan, procurement plan, human resources management plan. Okay, detailed steps uh, to be taken during planning. All those which I won't really go through them, you can uh, go through yourself. Then these are the components of the statement of work that I mentioned earlier on. We're going to have a statement of purpose. Statement of purpose basically gives us the reason why are we working on this particular project. Why have we undertaken it? And then we've got a scope statement with which basically gives us all the activities that's supposed to be done. Uh, it's very important, even those that you're not supposed to do, they need to be specified as to, okay, you can do this, that, and that, but don't do this. 
think of, you know, like I said, example of building a house. A customer, you need to agree that, okay, fine, I'm going to build you a house, maybe charging you this much, but this is what I'm going to do, fit in, you know, and I'm not going to maybe, you know, put the tiles. You need to mention that. I won't put the tiles. That would basically explain the scope. Deliverables as to what deliverables or other outputs um, in terms of a physical um, tangible output, you need to mention it. Goals and objectives, you need to mention that um, which are basically seen as your success criteria. Because once you manage to achieve this particular goal and that one basically means that you you have successfully, you know, managed whatever that is that particular project. The cost and schedule estimates, you need to come up with those estimates like we, we said before. List of stakeholders, we know what are the stakeholders now. Then the chain of command is to basically who reports to who that we know. Then assumptions and agreements. Sometimes you know, there could be some things that can somehow, you know, inhibit or rather challenge the, the progression of whatever they will be doing there, you know, or, or execution of that particular project. Those assumptions, you need to mention them, you know, say this and this and this, you basically list them. And then if ever there's any agreements that you, you agreed on, like, Things that you agreed on, you need to mention them down there, okay? And then lastly, you need to come up with a plan of communication as to how you're going to basically communicate with the stakeholders. That would be the end of our learning unit three.